All right. Let's get started, I think. I guess people will still move in. So, as I said again, welcome to the presentation of the uh, launch of a new, brand new report, which we have uh, published yesterday in time for the Bits and Bäume conference. The report is called Digital Reset, Redirecting Technologies for the Deep Sustainability Transformation. And it's authored by a whole group of authors um, or people of whom not all are here actually, but we are a, a crowd already and I will present them and even the others who cannot be here today in a minute. My name is Tilman Santarius, I am from the TU Berlin here and from Einstein Center Digital Futures and I was also amongst the team of the Trägerkreis that launched the first Bits and Bäume four years ago. And when we did this, in the aftermath of the first Bits and Bäume, um, Johannes Reidel from the Robert Bosch Foundation approached me and said, Tillman, this was a great idea. Why don't you want to lift this to the scientific level and implement the very same idea of the Bits and Bäume in the scientific community? And this is, in a way, the result. So what we did then is, after it took almost two years to get the project started due to various reasons. But what we then did is bring together a group of people from different scientific disciplines, different fields of experts and fields of knowledge and discourse, different epistemic communities, you could say, also different countries. And this is the group. I show you where we're all from. Um, so you see at least the faces, several of the faces are here. We have um, several um, members of our expert panel from Great Britain, from France, from Spain, from Denmark, from Stockholm. I show you the next slide where, we, where you can see the institutions associated with the faces. And I will say the names in a minute, it just wouldn't fit all on the slide. And um, the idea was to deep dive into the relationship of digitalization and sustainability, both in a social and in a environmental perspective. We conducted five workshops, three, three day workshops, so pretty intense. Um, we started out all fully virtual, of course, due to the pandemic situation, but then we met also in Brussels in May this year and had a smaller workshop with members from the European Commission and the Parliament to discuss policy prescriptions that we have developed. And I think now we are really happy or even maybe proud to present to you an up-to-date, interdisciplinary and comprehensive analysis of the opportunities, risks, but mostly also of the governance options and solutions regarding digitalization and sustainability. Now, the report argues that governing the megatrend of digitalization, all the different facets and aspects, should live up to today's societal challenges. And I mean, if you heard the keynote talks yesterday uh, evening, there was already a lot of interlinkages, interlinkages between digital technologies and their implications and for instance, runaway climate change, our lifestyles, the loss of biodiversity, but also social issues like increasing polarization, um, even war and conflicts. And we believe that as digitalization is a means and not an end, it should live up to contributing, to solving, to overcoming these crises. Uh, when you talk to governments or business people, or maybe even uh, many of us here in the room, there's hope that digital technologies can contribute to solving these crises, these challenges. But overall, and you will hear that in all the talks that we'll be following now, overall, I think the state of knowledge demonstrates that by and large, the kind of mainstream current digitalization driven by big tech companies, so the mainstream of digitalization is rather aggravating the crisis and not solving it. Take, for example, the polarization of income. We have looked at various studies that show that digitalization 
increases the income gap within firms, between firms, between countries that are more or less digitalized, and also between a growing share of capital income in GDP and a shrinking share of salaries in GDP. So it basically widens the gap between the rich and the poor. And it's pretty similar to the environmental side. We see a lot of environmental inequalities, but take, for instance, all the additional burdens for the environment that come about by the manufacturing, but also by the operating and by the new consumption habits, the digital consumption habits that are putting additional pressure on resource, energy demand, and emissions. And these are just larger than the savings potentials at the moment, than the savings potentials that can be realized by applying digital technologies in the various sectors. So all in all, we think the current form of digitalization is rather optimizing the unsustainable status quo rather than transforming it. And that is why we are calling out for this fundamental redirection of the purpose of technologies so that they put in service for a deep sustainability transformation. We should govern, we as the society, the policymakers, business representatives, but we as users can also make a difference, should govern, should shape digitalization in a way that it eliminates the root causes and not just alleviates the symptoms of current crisis. Let me go into the structure of the report, and you will find copies of the report in the back. I heard that a lot of people already took some copies. We have another box in the front here, and if we run out of these copies, you're most welcome to meet us in the forum over there in the maths building, where we have another table on the first floor in the gallery, where there's tons of other reports, hopefully enough. Um, so the structure of the report is that after introduction, we go into part one and explain and lay out why digitalization needs to be redirected. And we start with painting a panorama of the root causes or of some of the root causes. So yes, there's climate crisis, biodiversity crisis, etc. But what are the root problems behind these um, obvious crises? And we mention the high levels of consumption in the global north and the transnational consumer class, the linear economy, the kind of throwaway economy where they extract resources, fabricate goods, use them ever shorter and then throw them away. And there's other root causes that we briefly sketch out because this is the panorama. These are the challenges that need to be overcome by a deep transformation and digital technologies should contribute to it. We also map briefly some of the challenges that the process of digitalization has brought about in the last decades. And I mean, many of you will be very familiar, the increasing uh, um, concentration of market power, even monopolies in many areas, the power asymmetries that arise in society as a whole, who has the data, who has the information, who has the capital. Um, for new and very pervasive forms of surveillance, the appropriation of commons, you name it. So we paint again a panorama of the challenges that digitalization has brought about so far and that also need to be addressed or even overcome in order to achieve that kind of deep sustainability transformation that, uh, that is needed. Now, in another chapter, and now I start handing it over to uh, my, all of my co-author colleagues here, in another chapter in part one, we take stock of digital technologies and how they have performed with regard to social environmental sustainability in the past, and what is the potential of these technologies in the future. And I will now hand it over to Lorenz Hilti, professor at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. Lorenz, you have a headset? Yes. Okay, and you will hear okay. short yeah. three, four minute inputs by all of us so that we all have the voice here and Lorenz is going to talk about taking stock of digitalization for sustainability. Thank you, Tillman. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, I have six statements uh, and one conclusion. Statement one, um, technically, the digital technology is um, actually a success story in terms of energy efficiency and materials efficiency. So we can deliver more and more 
computational power with less and less energy and materials input. That sounds good, but at the macro level, we don't see this efficiency. We, what we see is an increase over decades, an increase of energy consumption of the whole <coughs> digital technology, and also an increase in <coughs> the mining activities for the more than 50 chemical elements that are included in our digital hardware. Um, so there is a sort of contradiction, but it is not a contradiction from an economic point of view. This is just a rebound effect. If we can do something more efficient, more convenient, more uh, fa faster, then we will have more demand for it. And that explains uh, this development. And there, is even, uh, there are even estimates that say that we will have another doubling of the, the energy and, and CO2 um, problem within the digital technology within the next 10 to 15 years. And we are not really in a world that can afford it. Today, the, the whole digital technology is at a level of 2 to 4 percent of uh, global CO2 emissions, or to be more precise, of global greenhouse gas emissions. And this is not so much at the moment compared to other more carbon intensive sectors such as the mobility sector or the building sector or also agriculture. Um, so we could also argue, well, it's, it is a footprint, but it's not so much, and maybe it is worth the handprint of digitalization. Handprint, I mean, how can we use this technology to make other processes more heavy process is more efficient, more, more energy efficient, um, more carbon efficient, or substitute some atoms by bits, replace some atoms by bits, etc. So we can have these substitution effects, and we could argue that this handprint is worth this uh, footprint. The problem is that all studies that are really telling us that this handprint could be big, they are talking about potentials. And I'm the author of some of these studies. I, uh, it is r really important to note that this um, carbon abatement, CO2 abatement, that can be um, estimated for the digital technology is based on the potential and not on real uh, reductions that can be shown yet. Um, so it seems that it depends completely on the political framework decisions, whether this handprint of the digital technology is really realized. If we go on, go on like, uh, like we do in the moment, um, I have really, I see no hope that we can, that we can realize or um, explore uh, this potential, exploit this potential that digitalization would have in an ideal world. So um, we cannot really afford another doubling of the footprint of digital technology and just wait for the digital miracle. We need principles for the framework conditions that really unleash uh, this potential. And this is actually what the, the um, report is telling you. Um, okay, so um, <laughs> the final conclusion. Um, there are several reasons why we must escape the pattern of more efficiency more demand and then more dependency of this technology, we should find a way of escaping this pattern. Otherwise, we will going to be going to miss the uh, opportunity to make digitalization really a part of the solution for all of our sustainability problems. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lorenz. So, due to that analysis, we suggest that there is a strong need for coherent cross-sectoral governance at all levels. We need to shape digitalization much more actively, politically, user-wise, by business, progressive companies, um, but by society as large, at large. And the question is, what are the new logics due to which digitalization should be governed and shaped? And part one of the report concludes with uh, a couple of principles that we outline. And I now turn it over to Dorothea Kleine from Sheffield University in Great Britain, who will 
detail to you our seven principles. Hello, everyone. So this is really exciting. We are going to suggest seven principles for a digital reset. And I'll take you through these one by one. Number one, regenerative innovation and design. So the design of digital technologies, hardware and software, should be determined by democratic and participatory processes and help regenerate natural ecosystems and promote social cohesion. What we're talking about is we want design within ecological limits. And we also want design processes that are inclusive of marginalized groups. Second, system innovations. So digital technologies should be used for system innovations that alter the basic operational patterns of sectors and arenas, rather than merely for incremental optimization so that maintain the status quo. We're not really interested in digital technologies that help us run faster in the wrong direction. What we're interested in is digitalization that is helping us realize alternatives. Um, and for example, we will hear from um, Angelika Hilbeck about agriculture, where it's not about making an unsustainable farming system more efficient, it's about actually enabling, in a, if you want, smart way, alternative and sustainable farming. Thirdly, sufficiency. So the prevailing strategy of using digital technologies to improve efficiency must be guided by an overarching strategy for sufficiency, aiming to seek enough rather than more. In other words, we need to think about how much digitalization do we need? What is enough? Um, we need to get over our habits of um, overconsumption, um, our fixation on growth, and we need to focus on quality, including quality of life, over quantity. Fourth, circularity. Digitalization should be geared towards achieving circular production patterns, both in the ICT sector as well as in other sectors. So here, when we're talking about the ICT sector, and we heard some of that last night already, we're talking about repairability, recyclability, right to repair open construction plans, open source. And we also believe that digitalization plays an important role in turning other sectors to greater circularity and the circular economy. Fifth, sovereignty. So the use of data should be geared towards enlarging citizens' freedoms of choice and reducing dependencies. We want people um, to be in charge of their own data um, we want to enable users, citizens, people to be able to make informed decisions about their data, but we also want to regulate. Um, and that means that we should also look at where particular companies that we buy services from are located and whether they are actually in the jurisdictions that our democratic processes cover. Number six, resilience. Use digital technologies to foster economic decentralization and establish distributed economies to improve economic and societal resilience to crisis. So on a Saturday morning, Tillman has already cheered us up by talking about various crises that we face. Um, but we really think that decentralization of our systems will make them actually more resilient. So we want to focus also on local economies um, and also regional uh, networks and economies as well. Equity. That's our final principle and one that's very close to me personally, my heart, and I'm sure to many of us here on the podium. Digitalization should be designed to improve social and environmental equity. So at the moment, our society is characterized by deep inequalities on income, class, race, gender, age, disability lines, and um, often digital divides follow those, and in some cases, they make them worse. We want to see a more equitable digitalization, and that also means, in global terms, that we're seeking a digitalization not where people in the global north overconsume, and to some degree, part of that bill is paid by people in the global south who are involved in the process of, ex of extracting precious minerals, um, or indeed dealing with our e-waste. 
We have to think um, just as globally when we talk about a more sustainable future digitalization. Thank you. Thanks, Dorothea. So, with the panorama of the challenges, with the analysis of what digitalization has so far developed and on the basis of the principles, we then go into one of the hard chapters of the report, how digitalization can support deep sectoral transformation. So what we basically do, we look at all relevant sectors, relevant with a view to sustainability, also on, uh, on mobility and on consumption, but today we will give you, due to the people that are here, we give you sneak previews uh, into four sectors, and Angelika Hilbeck from ETH, Eidgenössische Technische Universität in Zurich, Hochschule in Zurich, <laughs> will start out with the chapter in agriculture. Yes, thank you very much. So, um, agriculture, I think, is probably not the first sector that most people working in the software and IT field are thinking about when it comes to digitalization. However, you may be surprised to learn that it is this field where some of these tools have been put to work and concepts have been developed that are actually quite progressed already and very much in use. So, but to say um, at the beginning, the consensus of our group was that digital tools soft and hardware, all of it together, platforms, etc., can or could have a positive and supporting role for transforming our currently destructive agro-food systems into sustainable ones. However, that will not happen by magic. So it has to be a guided and a purposeful um, process and it needs to be based on principles. So in our contribution, we started first to lay out the field with a critique of the current forms of digitalization into agriculture, which are driven by corporations, vast, mass, vast majority um, is, is driven by companies that have actually a long, long history already in the agro field and have been key and instrumental in designing and developing those chemical high input industrial forms of agriculture today. So they are all basically companies who have morphed from being chemical companies to become seed companies, biotech companies, and they have now vertically integrated those inputs into platform, digital platforms that they offer to their farmers. All of them uh, are introduced under headlines like wanting to help solve climate change, world hunger, biodiversity, etc but none of them have obviously achieved that, and we give you a uh, kind of a uh, take-home message on analysis of why that is. And they're all building on actually reinforcing, if not boosting and expanding highly industrial forms of agriculture and centralization of it. And the deliver, they did deliver in terms of uh, some benefits that you or could argue as benefits, but they were exclusively in the field that Lawrence has been explaining in the efficiency. And it went according to what efficiency gains have done in the past, they all led to rebound effects. So the overall decline in what you would like to see, use of, of pesticides, chemicals, or or CO2, et cetera, has not materialized because the primary motivation is clearly to be control, market share, and profits. So in the second part of our contribution to the sector, we offer what we believe could help solve these problems. How should a digital tools, whether soft or hardware, how should they be designed and conceived from the start who should take part in that process from the start in order to support a true and a deep transformation of agriculture and our food and consumption systems. What we offer is not a, a, a um, a, a rule-based or a, a descriptive form, like a recipe, do this and then you will automatically end up in a good place, but it is rather something that is built on principles and concepts and purpose-driven and goal and problem solution-oriented. So it tries to address the roots of the problems, 
hoping that if you address the roots and you solve those, it will precipitate into some solutions and some improvement. Just to give you a brief example for those who are not into agriculture, so it is a fundamental difference from the get-go if you develop software or hardware solutions and support tools for an agro-food system that it is based on huge monocultures of single crops over a vast area or whether you conceive, develop and implement software and hardware solutions for a multi-cropping system in a highly diverse, small-scaled form of agriculture, of permaculture, of, of other ecological forms. You need completely different tools, and that needs to be decided right at the conception level already, and will be decided whether or not you take those stakeholders mid on, uh, on board that will have to use that. So we offer a little bit uh, principles. We offer how you could translate and how IT development processes and design processes in support and at the service of a deep transformation of our agri-food systems could orient itself, and we base this along the 10 elements of agroecology that was developed for and under the auspices of the FAO, the UN World Food Agriculture Organization. And we finish with um, giving an example in our paper how this could be put into practice um, at the root level, how you could actually do such design processes and such conceptualization processes. So I hope you will be curious to read more about it and um, consult our paper for details. Thanks, Angelika. Thank you. All right. Philipp Stab, professor at Humboldt University here in Berlin, will talk about some of our insights regarding industry. Hi, everybody. Um, so um, I have the delicate task to do a three-minute deep dive into what we um, think the digital sustainability transformation of the industrial sector should be. Obviously, this can't be um, very granular, but it could help to um, probably think about it in terms of a formula. And um, that formula, the way we see it, would be that um, we argue that we should move away from a digital capitalism um, based on the exploitation of personal data to a circular digital economy within the manufacturing sector based on product, process, and environmental data. The status quo in um, the industrial sector is that it is already highly digitalized, but at the same time, we have not seen a strong surge in energy and resource efficiency. Thus, instead of relying on efficiency gains alone, as is often the case in terms of the political discussion of how to use digital technologies in order to foster um, sustainability within the manufacturing sector, um, we argue for a pursuit of a combination of two sort of um, model objects, which is circularity and sufficiency. And I will say only a few words, as I have only these uh, three minutes, about the circularity part of things. So when you think about how to enable circularity within the industrial sector, there is one very obvious basic problem, which is that there is a lack of usable data which is, of course, needed in order to enable circularity, repair, reuse, recycling, and so on. So what we advocate for is an information-based circular economy which uses digital technologies in order to fill that gap. Um, we have three, more than three, but I'll only say a few words about three. Um, very basic um, approaches we thought of um, in terms of creating such an information-based uh, circular economy. One is that we argue that we should repurpose existing and uh, currently being built um, cloud platforms within the industrial sector in order to aggregate data um, that can be usable for circularity tasks. Secondly, we argue for a mandatory publishing um, of such data in order to, uh, to create access to it and make it actually usable in terms of enabling uh, repair, reuse, and recycling. And we also argue for a comprehensive framework for a digital product passport on the European level, um, which would also enable circularity. Besides enabling um, reuse, recycling, and repair of products, such a framework would, of course, also enable um, 
monitoring legal obligations that politics might want to put on the industrial sector, right? You have to have a certain transparency about the um, data that is gathered about the footprints and so on of certain manufacturing or manufacturing products in order to actually monitor um, any legal obligations that you put on a sector. And this could, of course, this data could also be used in order to inform decision making in the production sector itself, um, which of course has its own governance structure, um, but also politically <coughs> about the manufacturing sector. Thank you very much. Thanks, Philip. Wow, so you get a crash, crash insight here, not only in the report, but in the various, very different topics. We have two more sectors that we would like to present to you quickly. Marianne Rigug from the Technical University in Trondheim in Norway on the issue of energy. Thank you. This is, of course, uh, not news to anyone in this room, but uh, the importance to transform the energy sector away from fossil fuels towards more renewables have never been more important, given the Russian war in uh, Ukraine. And digitalization is uh, at the backbone of such a transformation because there is a need to, to manage the influx of renewables, more intermittent and decentralized energy resources, and there is an increased need to balance energy demand and energy use and energy supply. Uh, this means that automation, uh, integration and coordination by means of technologies and digital services is highly important for the energy transition to happen. However, we also see new challenges arising from this development, such as shifting power relations, and when decision-making is increasingly automated, taking place in systems that are increasingly complex, we also need to understand the consequences of such systems. And how do they relate to issues such as justice, uh, public acceptance, uh, legitimization and trust? And these issues become even more important and is today very to a little degree, I would say, a knowledge in the energy sector. So if you go into one of these principles that we have outlined, the principle of equity, this becomes increasingly crucial, and I will just briefly explain why. Uh, if you look at our research, for example, on the ability to shift energy use in, uh, over time and in space, we know that this is highly unevenly distributed among different groups in society. So this means that digital tools that automate and manage energy demand in households, they may, may deepen these uh, already existing inequalities. And we argue in our report that the digitalization of the energy systems therefore needs not only to be governed more carefully, but they also de need to be developed more by more inclusive means and in a more transparent way in order to, to secure equity. And in the report we therefore uh, suggest several, uh, we have several recommendations. For instance, we suggest uh, and that we de the development what we call anticipatory, anticipatory governance, tricky word, uh, the governance that try to be more attentive towards uh, potential unwanted consequences and risk created by digital energy systems. And we propose the establishment of institutions like this that can monitor and follow innovations and uh, policies and developments more carefully uh, to secure transparency, inclusiveness, sovereignty. And even more concretely in the report, we suggest that we should establish science and technology advisory boards that could advise policymakers on these issues, on the energy transitions. And, and, uh, but it, this could, of course, also be transferred to other sectors, such as the building industry. And uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, that will be the next speaker. Thanks, Mariana. Matthias Höyer from KTH, Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden. Thank you, Tinman. So, 
Yeah, I will only be talking about one of the things behind me here, and it's up to you to understand which one it is. So you have to listen carefully. And if you want to talk about the other ones, then find me out there during the coming days, and we can talk about them as well. So, uh, construction and buildings is uh, a highly resource-consuming sector with time frames of 50 years and more because of how long the buildings stand. And this is a problem since the transformation is needed now. Altogether, the sector's global energy use is increasing. And the reason being that even though we have a technological development reducing the energy use per square meter, we are still building more and more buildings, so the total volume is increasing faster than the technology is making things more efficient. And now I will tell you, the only thing I will talk about today out of those things is the intensified use of building things. Better use of buildings would reduce the total demand for, for a floor area, and as a consequence of this, the total demand for new buildings. This could reduce the costs, for example, for offices, for an organization, but it could also increase the revenues for landlords since they could charge more per square meter. Moreover, with more people in commercial buildings in cities, those cities would be more livable and lively, and office buildings that become redundant could be used for other purposes. So there is a lot to gain on this transformation. Digitalization, then, can support this kind of transformation in terms of intensifying use of buildings by the support and opportunities to create flexibility in the use of buildings. Specifically, this is about uh, creating strong matchmaking services, and those are, of course, already happening, uh, but also through the ability to create other services in terms of, for instance, security, personalization and, and other office services. I am convinced that digitalization can support a strong transformation of the building sector towards uh, uh, low resource use without compromising the affordability of housing. But it may require some quite strong policy measures. The good message is that there are some self-reinforcing in, in, self loops that can be created here. Because digitalization creates opportunities for new ways of intensifying the use of buildings. And the implementation of those opportunities can reduce resource use. But already the opportunity in itself creates room for policy actions. So to be more concrete, since digitalization makes it possible to use space more efficiently, it becomes feasible to introduce for instance, a tax reform hitting at space waste. So this push and pull effect of digitalization and for, well, of digitalization for sustainability is actually a principle that exists more or less for all sectors. And that's something to keep in mind when continuing listening to us. Thank you. Thanks, Matthias. And yes, this is just Oh, these are just some insight into the sectoral, um, sectoral issues, sectoral topics that we dive into. Let's step back a little bit and again explain the logic of our approach, our report. We argue that the sectoral sustainability policies in agriculture, in industry, in energy, in mobility, in consumption, etc., should become more digital in the way of that they need to address systematically the opportunities and risks of digital technologies in the various fields and at the different levels. I mean, just to give you an example, the common agricultural policy at the EU level should have an own chapter or at least a systematic consideration of what are the risks and opportunities of digital technologies or industry government in countries such as Germany or mobility uh, policies at the community level or in cities. These should treat the risks and opportunities and governance options of digital technologies more comprehensively. That is part two of our report and we believe that we will get the most out of digital technologies and that it will, will be more um, positively contribute if 
Sustainability transformations are already ongoing in these sectors. So we need to have transformation, transformative policies in place first, and then the governance of digital tools should subordinate to the goals and the ambitions in the various respective sectors. And then in part three of the report, we flip the coin and look at the digital governance. And similarly, we argue that all the digital governance should become explicitly sustainability oriented. Take, for example, the data governance or the market governance or service sector governance, the e-commerce directive at the EU level. These po or smart city policies at the community level, these policies should deliberately include goals that address social and environmental issues. And we will now dive into some of the um, sectors or some of the digital governance aspects. Here you see that this uh, part of the report has four chapters. We have an own chapter on the question of how can we make the production operation of ICT hardware more circular and more sufficiency oriented because that is the very basis. Basic is, is basically the, the old debate about green IT which has lost nothing of this, its relevance until today. But we will look now into the chapters on business models. How can we achieve a fundamental change in business models, namely of the big tech companies in the world. And then we will finish up with some insights on data governance and artificial uh, intelligence. And I turn it over to Hugues Ferbeuf, uh, our colleague and co-author from Paris. Uh, he's with the Shift Project and he will now talk about the business models. Thank you, Tinman. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, as you may have seen, I've uh, rolled up my sleeves. And why? Because we have a difficult task uh, in front of us. We have to make the big tech smaller. <laughs> and why? Why? Because their business models uh, are probably one of the main root causes of the fact that uh, um, digitalization at the moment uh, is adverse to sustainability. So, <clears throat> let's explain a little bit. Um, as uh, Lawrence pointed it out, um, the uh, energy consumption uh, from the digital industry has been growing in the past 10 years, and at the moment is growing at a pace of, let's say, 6% per year, which means that in 10 years from now, it could almost double. In the same time, in these past 10 years, we have seen the digital industry, let's say, um, completely reconfigured around dominant players, and these dominant players are the big tech. Big tech are the GAFAM, plus Netflix, plus maybe two other companies. And these uh, big tech uh, are actually not only driving the market, they are creating the market. Um, in between um, 2018 and 2021, uh, these big tech uh, are been the cause of 75% of the growth of the internet traffic. Can you imagine? 75%? And this growth is tremendous. And it's so huge that uh, even the, the best technologies cannot provide um, enough progress in terms of energy efficiency to absorb this uh, growth of volumes. And why is that? Well, just because the business models of the big tech do require such volume growth. In, uh, in a nutshell, um, big tech derives their revenues from uh, selling information related to users that use the services. So we use the platforms for free, but then all the information we provide to them in terms of behaviors, in terms of personal data, is going to be um, uh, the substance 
that they will use to generate revenue, uh, um, uh, sending that to uh, our third party companies. And it works. It works as these big tech are now uh, the most financially valued companies in the world. But it doesn't work on the sustainability level. And you should not be um, uh, misleaded by um, the strategies this big tech have announced in terms of uh, decarbonization. In a nutshell, they've said, and they can do it, that they will uh, actually uh, make sure that all the electricity they use is going to be uh, generated out of renewable energy. And actually, if they do that, yes, uh, their direct emissions will be on the right path towards uh, carbon neutrality in 2050. But what we demonstrate in the report that if they continue to grow the volumes in the way they did, they will continue to have their electricity consumption grow in the range of 25 to 40% a year. And by doing that, all the rest of the digital system will see its energy consumption growing approximately at the same rate. And, and the indirect GHG emissions will rise uh, as they have never done. So, <clears throat> there are possibilities to do, to provide the same services as the big tech, but with alternative business models. Um, for instance, cooperative platforms. And I've seen actually that in the program, there is um, a, a dedicated presentation to that, I think tomorrow. Um, <clears throat> But if we want these uh, alternative solutions to fly, the first thing we have to do is to make sure that there is a market for them. And if we want to have a market for them, first we must make sure that the big tech becomes smaller. So we have to apply the right taxes, regulations, um, and uh, we also have to make sure that all the new policies on personal data um, are strict enough to prevent the existing mod business models to continue. So <clears throat> that's the conclusion, and that was the introduction. We have to make the big tech smaller. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Hugues. And we're finishing up with the last input by Stephanie Hanke, head of the Tactical Tech Collective here in Berlin, actually, but also with international office. Stephanie. Thanks. Hi. Uh, following UG, I've rolled up my sleeves too, but only part way, because I'll try to say something positive to end the discussion. Um, the, um, our section on data governance acknowledges that there's been a lot of progress on data governance. There's been an increasing understanding that there are harms uh, related around digital technologies and data, but also that there's a real potential common good. Um, but it really points to the blind spot on the environmental side and that we're not having joined up conversations. So, for example, when we're looking at things like data that we need to understand mobility in the city, we're not thinking about environmental data and things like privacy and anti-discrimination at the same time, but we should be. Or, um, leading off from Ugg's points, the question of who holds the data um, on uh, at the large scale with big tech, thinking about who has access to that information, not just at the global level or where the companies are in the US, but also at the regional and national level, really depends on what we can do when it comes to using that data for sustainability. So there are three um, different kinds of things that we uh, propose on sustainability-oriented data governance. Uh, one of those is looking at those harms, for example, where companies um, like Google and Facebook who are using targeted advertising um, to drive overconsumption, how that should change, but also should harms be included, like when corporates and governments withhold data that we need in the context of sustainability. Secondly, thinking about uh, data asymmetries. 
So the way in which those monopolies not only, uh, or data monopolies, should I say, um, not only uh, make an unfair market and create centers of, of economic and social power, but also where they block innovation. So where can young companies not come in because they don't have access to the information? Um, and thirdly, um, rethinking the kinds of incentives and um, expansion of data we might need in order to really understand how to solve some of these problems. And there are things that can be done, like pilots with trusts, data commons, um, or data collaboratives, that we are not really experimenting with but should. For example, how would it look different if um, public and private collaborations happened around something like gathering energy data or um, mobility in the city, and how could that drive forward solutions? Um, so the, the thing I want to say not only about this section but also the report in general is that there are not, are not only descriptions of the problems but also solutions proposed. Um, some of these are about really unlocking the potential of data and technology in this context, how it can be um, catalytic, how it can be proactive as well. Um, for example, going back to um, Philip's presentation, thinking about the barriers to information that we could remove um, and at the same time really starting to understand which kinds of information we really need and how would that make a difference and not enough work's being done to investigate that at this point. So I think I have the last say and we're coming to the end of a long uh, go-round, I think. So I just want to come back to the beginning uh, where Dorothea started saying, we don't want technology that makes us run faster in the wrong direction, but rather um, we want to put on the table concrete suggestions and solu solutions of how we can have purposeful design of technology and how that technology can be in service of the things we want to solve in society. So I hope you heard something uh, that you liked amongst the many different points of view here um, today. Uh, if so, you can find the report printed here. You can also download the report. Please share it widely. Uh, and I'll hand it over to Tillman. Thanks. Okay, so I hope you got some insights from our report. I mean, it's here to read it, grab a copy. I think what maybe also came across to you in the audience that for me, and I guess for many of us, it was really a great experience of having these people all sitting together for, as I said earlier, multiple workshops, dive into the issues. I learned so much and we also had fun. I mean, we never, most of us never met before, but we grew together as a group and developed quite a comprehensive perspective, so it was great. Um, we are using up time here. The meeting is officially only until 11.30, but there is no other um, uh, event in the room, so we can go a bit longer for questions and answers. For those of you who have to run, he's saying no. Okay, but anyway, for those of you who will uh, have, we want to discuss more with us, we have a meeting at five o'clock this afternoon, a community meetup, Bits and Bäume Goes International, so you can meet all of us again to extend the discussions or to talk about the methodology of our group and our research project, if you want. Um, let me just, uh, say two announcements. I would like to bring best greetings from the other lead author, Stefan Lange, who lays down in bed with Corona. I would love to thank Johanna Pohl and Patricia Jankowski, who are standing in the back there, and also Nina Guldenpenig and Jana Appel for the great support in the back office for the whole project, but also for making this report possible. And now there's some... Thanks. And now there's still some time for questions. We're here. Um, please come or raise your hand. I'll go down in the audience if you have any questions that you want to address. And we'll see whenever you think we should stop, just turn off the, the energy. <laughs> Are there any questions? Right in the front here. Maybe you just say your name real quick. Hi, I'm Anne, nice to meet you. Um, could only uh, listen for a little while. Uh, I'm just wondering, um, I haven't looked at your report yet, but I'm just wondering if you have, if you're already collaborating with actors that are actually working on those kind of goals and uh, purpose-driven endeavors. Um, yeah, are you, do you have any collaborations to industry or any community actors? <laughs> Wow, I think we could come up with a lot. Who wants to answer? Can I, who raises hand first? Any idea? Hugh, you want to go, May? Go for it. Yeah. Don't take my mic. Yeah, my mic is working. 
Um, well, it depends which industry. Hmm? It's clear with what I said uh, about the big tech, it's going to be difficult to have some positive cooperation. Um, the experience I have with the, the shift project in, in France is that uh, there is a substantial number of uh, companies now that really want to change and they really want to change themselves. Um, and um, and in, in, the, in the working groups we organize often, we have people coming from these companies and, um, and then, then they import in their companies what they learned in the collective work. Uh, and now these companies are also organizing uh, as kind of virtual federations, let's say. Um, and, um, but I would say um, it's good, but again, if we want things to change and we need things to change fast, uh, we also have to make sure that new regulations force the companies that do not want to change, to change. Thanks. I think the question would be a good one also to discuss in the afternoon at the community meetup because we all have many corporations ongoing, I think. There's another question here in the audience. Um, so Ali Gumisha is my name. I'm from the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society, and I have a similar question in terms to um, related to another stakeholder, the politicians. So this um, report, of course, is a toolbox, right, to be used also in engagement with politicians. So what are the next steps? Like, uh, will you strike tomorrow in front of the Bundestag, or what are the next um, ways forward? How you use the report to engage with politicians in Europe and uh, and the world? Thank you. Well, As I said earlier, I think we already engaged with politicians. We had one uh, member in our expert panel as an observer. Uh, we used the observer status to, to remain independent, but he is an employee, a senior consultant to the commission DG Connect. So he was part of the discussions we had in the group. We had a meeting in May, a uh, closed shop, uh, sort of uh, Chatham House Rules workshop with a group of selected policymakers from various fields. Um, and we are going to present the report in Brussels. Do you want to contribute some more ideas? I mean, we're not the kind of lobby groups. We presented the toolbox. I think I like the, the idea and the very comprehensive overview. And uh, I think it would need another project to bring it uh, into, the, uh, into the doors and rooms and where, where things are really negotiated. That's not part of the project. One more question here, and I think then we need to wrap up, probably. Michael Alman, I have a question about not only politics, but to, uh, to say trade unions. Are there any cooperation paths on your side uh, to cooperate and change workforces? Let me see, do we have another question? Maybe female, maybe <laughs> diverse, I don't know. Can I hear your pronomen? No, just kidding. Um, okay, we just collect the question and then we answer it together. Don't, you want to come here? Don't. Sorry? Is there another question that I missed? I can speak with a very uh, low or high voice, if that helps. Um, I have a question about, uh, is there an, an inventory of uh, methodologies that organizations that can use for uh, transforming to more, uh, a more sustainable uh, organization. Have you been looking at these uh, frameworks or methodologies? It's the second time this question comes. Thank you. Okay, last option here. And then you think about who wants to answer to which question. Is that okay? <laughs> mm. Yes, hello. My, my name is Alexandra Geze. I have somewhat of a question, somewhat of an answer, because I'm a member of the European Parliament, and since policymakers have been asked to, to have been called upon, like to, to intervene, um, we have been trying actually to bring these ideas into European legislation as the Green Group in the European Parliament. But it has been extremely difficult, and we have never found a majority, neither the support of the European Commission, nor the support of my colleagues in the European Parliament. And I think one problem is the narrative. 
Because when you speak about digitalization, people will tell you, well, bringing sustainability criteria into that legislation, that will hamper innovation. And that's obviously um, the industry that comes with that kind of narrative, which we don't share, but there's a sort of dichotomy, dichotomy between sustainability on the one hand and innovation on the other hand. <laughs> so my question to the distinguished panel is how can we change that? And how can we establish a discourse that says innovation is only innovation when it's sustainable because we don't have time anymore for any kind of different innovation. I think if we can win that kind of discourse, we will also have the chance to get all your ideas into the legislation because so far it has been very, very difficult. Thank you. Okay, cool. That addressed the first question also again. So we have the question, trade unions, inventory, and again, how can we uh, fine-tune the narrative, bring it better in? Anybody wants to answer? Dorothea, please. Um, I wanted to come back on the narrative point, and then I hope some um, other colleagues will kind of jump in on the, on the other questions. But in terms of narrative, it seems to me that there is, in this particular, at this particular time, um, there is an opportunity to say, look, um, we accept that um, arguably Europe is not, the, at the moment, the primary home of technology companies. Um, so, of course, our, our um, colleagues and friends in North America have incumbents uh, that they have to protect to some degree, or they think they have to protect. But arguably, Europe has fewer of them. Um, there's also um, kind of key big tech companies in China with a different model. Um, if Europe is to catch up, if Europe is going to innovate, then surely in the year 2022, you don't innovate like you did 10, 15, 20 years ago. You innovate for a future that we can actually sustain. So it seems to me that an innovation um, ideal and a design principle in 2022 needs to look different. And I would say, you know, if we can get, and Steph is very strong on this, if we can get um, design schools um, thinking about design that is sustainable, if we can think about how we create markets, and that would be Philip's kind of point, um, how we can have um, businesses innovating in a market that is set towards sustainable criteria, and if we can collectively think about how we make social innovation and technical innovation kind of merge together in a sustainable framework, then I think that is our opportunity at this particular point in time. And that should be our narrative for a different digital future. Thank you. I get repeated signs that we should close this meeting. So I now uh, declare this uh, session for officially closed. I guess that's a technical question with the live stream. Thank you everybody, uh, everybody so much and we will still answer some questions right now for those in the room either with the microphone or not. You can also come up to the stage. Angelica, I wanted to, to in. add a little to, to what you said, which I second uh, totally, but the, the debates in Brussels or in any political arena are kind of uh, already from the start set on the wrong track because you keep those things separate. You have the new green deal and then you have the digital transformation. You, you know, you're, you're doomed to end up in parallel bubbles who debate things in isolation and disconnected of issues that are fundamentally connected at the, at the beginning of it already. So I don't know to what degree you guys in, in Brussels and the parliamentarians can make an effort in insisting that these things are thought, conceived, debated in conjunction and not in separate uh, uh, bubbles and separate committees and separate, you know what, I mean the whole thing is totally disconnected. And if you manage that, I think you, you will find that debates will take on a different form different path and you will have different actors coming into it and it may start already to be a little better than, than right now. But right now it's just like doomed from the get-go, you know. Yeah, well, regarding also this with the uh, um, corporations with... Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Speak up loud. Yeah, okay. okay. So with different corporations in different ways, how do we bring these two policymakers? It's also like, I, I think all of us 
are participants in different advisory groups in different ways, and that way a report like this will probably squeeze into different discussions in, in a lot of different ways, not just by presenting the report, by through different advisory groups that we are in. Regarding the uh, the uh, union organizations, I, I have been worked very little with them, but I've been a bit disappointed uh, when doing so, and I think. The problem there has been that it, to some extent unions uh, <laughs> protect the current workforce and it's difficult, it's been difficult sometimes to bring in uh, that there might be a need for change. If I speak for a bit longer, it's been hard to argue. <laughs> Bis heute Nachmittag, 5 Uhr. Danke.